distinguished panelists, distinguished guests, uh, it is a, a great pleasure to welcome you to this next session of the Bled Strategic Forum. My name is Bethany Bell. I'm a BBC foreign correspondent, and I have been lucky enough to be able to have spent much of my working life based here in Central Europe. And uh, I would now be very happy to invite our panelists, hello, to take a seat. I think you're here. And so you're here. We have an eminent panel here today. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Joseph Borrell, the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, our host, Andrzej Logar, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Ivan Korczok, the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. Digitally, we are joined uh, by Ms. Michelle Müntefering, the Minister of State at the German Federal Foreign Office. We have uh, Thomas Petricek, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. We have Dr. Gordon Gerlic Radman, the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Republic of Croatia. We have uh, Mr. Zbigniew Rao, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland, and also Peter Siarto, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Very, very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. It is a privilege to actually be here in person uh, today, which is really not a given in these strange times, which have thrown so many aspects of our societies into uh, chaos, can one say, into turmoil, into movement. Is this a turning point? Will we emerge stronger when it comes to multilateralism and the EU? And most crucially of all, how do we get better? Now, before I start putting some of these questions to the panel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, I would very much like to invite you into my world, which is a world of broadcast journalism and short answers. Um, I live in a world where if I go on for a long answer, a voice comes in my ear and says, five, four, three, two, one, stop, and I have to stop. So I would ask you to keep your answers to be less than three minutes, and if you do go over that, I will interrupt you. Um, but uh, to begin, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Borrell, has there been, it's very, very easy to be pessimistic when one is in the midst of a pandemic. But has there been anything that has been a good example of multilateralism, something that perhaps has surprised you during the last few months? The European answer is good, a very good example of multilateralism, the best one. At the beginning, uh, the reaction was a uh, national one, uncoordinated. But quickly, the machinery started. The European Central Bank provided as much liquidity as needed. We launched sure this program to help unemployed people. We shifted restrictions on public debt and deficit. We repatriated more than 600,000 European people, 600,000 stranded around the world, which had been impossible without the European Union coordination. And finally, we launched this program, which uh, breaks two taboos. First, we cannot go to ask for money at the financial market collectively. And second, we cannot use this money to give uh, to be grants. These are two important steps on building European solidarity. So I think that the European Union has shown a, a clear way of answering to a common threat on a symmetric crisis because it affected to all of us without no one being guilty, but very much asymmetric on their consequences because not everybody has been touched in the same way. We have been able to step our 
the way we organize our solidarity, and I think that thanks to the virus, uh, it has been the catalyzer of an uh, improvement on the way Europe is facing the future together. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to ask our host, uh, Andre Loga, do you agree with that? Has Europe provided the answers that were needed? And, and what do you see has been a, a positive development in the last few months? Well, I don't know how it was before, because I became a foreign minister in the midst of crisis, so I can only comment for the day when I started. What this crisis brought to us is the need of a communication. I spoke every day, many times with these gentlemen here, besides Zbigniew, who recently joined the, the club of foreign ministers. And, and, and I remember that, you know, the, the, the crisis was like a catalyst that brought us together and showed the importance of mutual communication. And it gives, in a way, incentive to what, you know, foreign ministers and as well other ministers should do in their everyday life. So they should find together and talk the, the best solution for their fellow citizens. And what Europe showed, in a way, especially the recovery fund and the whole package of uh, this financial framework, is that it can be creative. It can be creative, it lasts a little, long, a little bit longer, but definitely we got some new ideas that one year ago no would nobody would come forward, and if somebody came forward with them, nobody would accept them. But the crisis showed that we can act together. Mr. Korczok, has Europe been the answer in this positive way uh, in terms of your country? Um, absolutely, yes. Uh, in, and what I wanted to add to it, of course, in parallel to what we have been doing back home, I agree with Joseph that it took a while on European level uh, to react, uh, but it was, in my view, a logical instinct in a, in a very first phase to react nationally. How otherwise could you establish a quarantine uh, within, within your own country? And we, in fact, by closing borders, have uh, established a quarantine vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors. But at that particular moment, um, what played a major role in, in our case was also regional uh, cooperation, with, basically with all my colleagues who are here uh, on this podium, we immediately entered into very intensive communication because this is what our people expected from us. The first shock to our people came from the very fact that they could not travel from Bratislava to Vienna, which is, in our case, you know, daily, daily life, daily routine. So national response, regional response, and European, maybe we will come back to it, but in terms of uh, how EU reacted in the first moment uh, when it comes to people, what people expected, uh, it was in a way impossible because EU was not equipped for that. EU was not up to deliver masks. People in the first moment expected that Europe would help, but, but how? delivering, you know, masks, and somebody else was delivering. But afterwards, uh, I think European response was very accurate. Uh, the European response is extremely important right now to lead us out of the crisis, and this is what Angela has mentioned with the recovery, uh, recovery fund. So I'll close it by saying we were, nobody was prepared for this. We've been improvising, but uh, when I look at my own country, I see a paradox because in the first wave, the figures were lower than they are now at this moment, where we have obviously entered the second wave. So before really being able to come up with a very complex analysis and assessment, we have to recognize that we are not yet over it. And uh, now it comes really to how we explain to our citizens that maybe limitations Wearing masks will be will be absolutely important for for a few weeks and months to come. Thank you very much. I'd now like to put a question to uh, Michel Montefering, um, who's joining us digitally. Was there anything unexpected uh, that you were positively pleased about in terms of uh, reactions among neighbours in the last few months? Yeah, dear colleagues. Um, Excellencies, 
Hello from Berlin. Um, I think until it broke out, the pandemic was just an abstract problem of a globalized world. We knew theoretically, but practically, we weren't sufficiently prepared, although the danger was there. And that, in my eyes, should be the lesson for all of us, taking serious what we know by fact and overcome this crisis by taking action and shaping the world we live in. So to refer to your question, and I think uh, Minister Ratman understands when I say that uh, COVID uh, is not only a surprise or something unexpected, um, but a defining challenge for our presidency. And actually, it has not surprised me at all that after important debates, the EU and its members proved to be successful in handling the pandemic and the consequences. So the overarching goal is to address this challenge in a well-coordinated way and ultimately contribute to making the EU stronger than it was before entering the crisis. Thank you very much indeed. I'd, I'd now like to uh, ask Thomas Petricek, was there something that you were surprised by when it came to dealing with all these border questions in terms of trying to ensure the ease of trade? H how was it for the Czech Republic? I believe that the surprising is uh, how easy uh, we can get back to national states that uh, people were not surprised that uh, we closed the borders uh, for traveling and they haven't complained much. Now they're complaining, but, uh, but uh, for us, uh, uh, more or less uh, freezing one of the fundamental freedoms of uh, European Union, which is uh, freedom of movement, wasn't so hard to, uh, to do. And uh, I believe that uh, there is a lesson for the future, I think, that uh, we need to communicate more, uh, that uh, uh, we haven't been uh, ready uh, to coordinate uh, at the beginning of the crisis, but uh, very soon we launched regionally with the neighbors, uh, very frequent uh, uh, discussions about how to adjust the measures in order to minimize the impact on the society, on our economies. And uh, if uh, we say that uh, nobody reacted 100% perfectly, uh, when I speak about European Union, for example, it was very crucial that the EU very quickly uh, interfered, uh, intervened uh, in order to uh, ensure uh, that uh, logistics works, that uh, uh, our lifeline in terms of uh, uh, movement of uh, goods uh, was ensured, especially the uh, essential goods, uh, that uh, we changed the, the rules, uh, for example, for state aid to assist uh, uh, to assist people in need and companies in need. And uh, I hope that uh, we will learn from the lesson and we will use it uh, in the upcoming months uh, uh, more effectively, because uh, as uh, Ivan told, uh, we are not yet over. Uh, the pandemic is with us. Uh, we need to uh, do maximum to minimize uh, unnecessary negative impacts on our economies and societies. The pandemic isn't yet over, we have months ahead. Um, Gordon Gelich radman for your perspective, what are the uh, positive uh, developments that we can build upon that you've noticed over the last months? Sure, uh, the, um, thank you. There are so many, many aspects of there. First of all, it was the creation of for us the EU president in the, in the history after, after only seven years uh, being member or membership of the European Union. And of course, we were well prepared to uh, organize their, to see the colleagues in Zagreb, uh, in Croatia, but no one expected this in the crisis. It's really an unprecedented uh, situation after the Second World War. And, uh, European Union was able just uh, to face with uh, some uh, uh, problem challenges, but not with invisible enemy like uh, uh, Corona did. Actually, we learned a lesson, and uh, it's good. It was the good proof and, and test 
for the solidarity, for the more communication, for their, uh, how to provide and uh, more uh, mutual uh, assistance and for us. But will, however, uh, European project survived and it's uh, already there. And like uh, Michelle, Michelle told that uh, really, uh, so I do remember after I had uh, in Berlin uh, hand over the Croatian president, uh, presidency to German, uh, so really, we do, uh, we did feel really experienced in these special circumstances. And first of all, we are. So I do remember that uh, European Union uh, reacted quickly, swiftly, and uh, we activated uh, during our presidency the uh, uh, integrated uh, the political uh, crisis response was, was very, very important. Uh, EU framework uh, for coordination, for communication, and to, to get an answer for this crisis. And like the, Mr. Borrell mentioned, actually unprecedented repatriation that the European uh, Union was able just uh, to bring home uh, more than 6,000, uh, 600,000 uh, uh, its citizens. But uh, so uh, Croatia uh, is uh, holding, uh, holding its presidency, of course, was uh, really an, uh, instrumental in coordinating with diplomatic uh, missions around the world. And we helped just repatriation, not only for, for European citizens, but also for the third country, our partners. And it is a good way and good sign how we uh, had, uh, we are enhancing the cooperation also with, uh, with other uh, countries around the European Union. There are so very good examples, I think, so for the future. Um, I'm interested also now in uh, taking the, the question to how the situation was in Poland. Um, do you feel that uh, you would agree with some of these examples of good cooperation? Was there anything else unexpected uh, that you discovered there? Um, yes, thank you. I, I believe that we, <clears throat> what we learned uh, from this uh, experience is, uh, first of all, who we are as Europeans, first of all, who we are as human beings, then who we are as citizens uh, of the European states, and then the last thing, what the European, European Union uh, really is. Uh, let me address the issue in, in, in this way. First of all, <clears throat> the first reaction was at least from the Polish perspective, it was, it was absolutely necessary to offer uh, immediate uh, assistance and help to the countries with, that were uh, strongly affected by it, to, to Italy and Spain, despite the situation uh, at home. And uh, indeed, almost in a spontaneous way, uh, Poland sent <coughs> Uh, doctors to, uh, above all, to, uh, to Italy. We, we exchanged the uh, medical information with, uh, and also with medical staff. Uh, later on in the region, including Slovenia, Hungary, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, in North Macedonia. So we were acting because it's, it was a, a call of heart that, first of all, you have to help people who are really in need and much more in need than we, are, we were at home. And I suppose it was a, a, a great proof of just human solidarity. The other thing was when the restrictions were imposed, it was a time of reflection whether we are Europeans uh, uh, more belief in f uh, personal freedoms, for example, pre freedom of movement, okay? Or we, as citizens, are more responsible for the common good. So, and we have to accept the, the restrictions. It was a huge debate going on uh, on these two, two uh, issues in every family, in fact, in, in every social circle. And the third thing, <clears throat> when we could count on the European Union <clears throat> in all these things that my predecessor discussed before, it became clear to us that one of the basic principles on which the Union is based really, really work, the principle of subsidiarity, okay? When you are not in a position to 
help yourself or you cannot manage at the level of a nation state, this is the way when you, can, you have every right to expect assistance from the European Union. Thank you very much. And now, uh, uh, Mr. Siarto, um, in terms of Hungary, uh, how, what would you identify as some positive, uh, surprising development in the last few months? Well, first of all, I think we, ha we all have to uh, recognize uh, how defenseless uh, we are to uh, unprecedented uh, challenges like the uh, pandemic. I remember that uh, during the first uh, weeks and months, um, we basically had to act either on our own or uh, based on cooperation organized on an intergovernmental level. Uh, that, of course, um, uh, has caused some new formats to become alive, like the uh, eastern neighbors of Austria. The meeting uh, of the format of which will take place in Ljubljana next week or the week uh, after, hosted by Anja, which remained a platform for cooperation based on the good experience we have collected during the, uh, the pandemic. I think we, uh, we have some consequences, um, though, what we, we have to draw now. First, that we, member states of the European Union, were fighting for the same medical devices on the same market against each other. I mean, we, we, shouldn't, um, we, we should be honest towards each other. That was the case. Ourselves and our agents were fighting for ventilators, for masks, for, uh, uh, for protective uh, suits, whatever, on the same market, which is many times criticized by us, uh, by the way, People's Republic of China. On the other hand, we had to understand that uh, states have to be ready to establish um, infrastructure which might seem totally unreasonable under normal and peaceful circumstances, like a capacity of, uh, of cargo aircraft. I mean, why would a country need such a capacity? But now here, when we had 185 planes coming and going back and forth between China and Hungary, it was absolutely clear that if we had such a capacity, it would have been much uh, easier. Uh, and, and I think what is, uh, what is uh, even more uh, important than that, that the, um, that the discipline showed by the people, at least in Hungary, was very remarkable. We did not have to introduce a total lockdown. We did not have to introduce a total curfew because uh, some limitations on the reasons why people were allowed to leave their homes was enough. We all have seen the um, reports coming from Italy mostly and some other uh, EU member states, of course, and it was obvious that we have to avoid that what had been happening there. So I think discipline, uh, drawing the uh, consequences and building strategic infrastructure, which might seem to be totally responsible from perspective of finances, especially under peaceful circumstances, is an obligation of a state. Thank you very much indeed. So we've heard some of the, the good examples uh, of perhaps what has come out of the last few months. I'd now like to turn to the things that perhaps didn't go so well. Um, and you said something, Mr. Petracek, which struck a chord with me and I think with, with a lot of European citizens, how easy it was for countries individually uh, to put freezers on uh, freedom of movement and it appeared for some outsiders at the beginning of this crisis that countries were not necessarily talking to each other very much about when they would decide to close the border or not. Um, if I could ask uh, Mr. Borrell, how you see that having gone and, and in terms of what would you urge now looking ahead for the next few months in terms of borders in particular? What do I urge uh, on the next month? Well, for me, the most important thing is to finish the work of the recovery plan. Because the recovery plan has been approved by the Council. But it's not enough. We live in a system where there is the European Parliament and there are the national parliaments. 
and we have to go for ratification in all national parliament and in some cases in regional parliaments. And it's not uh, completely clear that this will happen. I hope so, because if not, it would be a big failure. C could I ask also, uh, at going back uh, to what happened over the last few months, it appeared for many outsiders that when countries imposed border restrictions, they weren't talking to each other enough about it. Was that your impression or as well? Well, at the, at the European Commission, we have been working a lot in order to coordinate the decisions of closing or opening borders. Because, you know, if someone open but the neighbor closes, it's useless. We have to coordinate in order to create green corridors, and especially during the touristic season, in order for people to be able to move, because every year, hundreds of millions of Europeans, there is a big movement from the north to the south and east to the west, and it had to be preserved. Yes, it would have been better, a stronger coordination among us. But, you know, uh, this is national uh, capacity. These are national competences. Health is a national competence. The European Union has no competence on health, almost no one. Uh, so when people say, oh, the European Union didn't give a quick answer on the health side, well, sorry, we couldn't. We don't have competences. And people don't understand very clear which is the competent for doing what. The same thing about closing and opening borders. We need more coordination, but I think that at the end it was not so bad. And the problem was not appearing at the same time at the same places. At the beginning, even some countries believed that, well, it's not going to be so bad. We should not take uh, restrictions. Other overreacted, some underreacted. And at the end, it was a puzzle. A puzzle that, uh, look, it has not been perfect, but they think that it could have been much worse. Without the European Union, you could just imagine what would be the situation without a coordination centre as the European Union is. Thank you very much. Dr Logar, what for you could have gone better in the last few months in terms of cooperation with your neighbouring countries? Well, everything could have gone better. I mean, we... We can talk about perfectionism, but some things were very good, so this were sufficient to, to, to do it. I think what is very important was what before chief of IMF said. She said, if I'm not mistaken, that we poured into the system 11 trillion US dollars just to remain more or less as we don't feel that we are in the biggest crisis after the 30 years. So can you imagine? what efforts had to be done in order that we don't feel the severity of the crisis. And if you take respect this, that let's say for a couple of weeks or months you had to be at home, I think don't, this is not a, a big price. So I think what is important, what we are going to do now, so that we will coordinate accordingly to what we want to achieve and that we will not stop again the economy as we did at the first time. You know, it's like when there is an illness and you don't know correctly how, how severe it is, you cut the big slice. But then now it's time for the, this surgical instrument to be more precise and more targeted uh, and that we remove only the things that, we, that it are necessary and we keep what is necessary to turn economies around. Because I don't think so we can afford another circle like we had in, in past. Uh, Mr. Korczak, if I could ask you, um, are there things that you would be keen on seeing improve uh, in terms of how we face the next few months, the, the mistakes that were made that you've identified that you would like to see? Yes, they are, obviously, and if you look back, if you look back at, the, uh, at those months uh, where the whole pandemia started, I believe globally, uh, what should work better is um, what the global international organizations could do. Um, here I mean World Health Organization, and I'm not going to criticize them for everything what they have done or have not done. 
but certainly we have to come back to it and review uh, to what extent we national states are providing data to them so that they can really, in an initial uh, phase, step into it and um, basically um, alarm and, and, and uh, ring the bell uh, globally and say, well, you have to act immediately, because I think that was one of the problems in the, in the initial uh, phase. So in, in some of the corners um, of the world, we've seen something wrong is going on out there, but we only recognize that it's immediately in my, in my backyard when it was there, and that was too late. So I think the global system of surveillance in, the, in this area of, of health protection. It's absolutely uh, something where we have to look uh, back at it. Uh, number two, not only are we, uh, are we trying to cope with the, the consequences with pandemia itself, but two, I think, very obviously, we're uh, facing a huge spread of disinformation, uh, both international, internationally, and domestically. And I believe here we have to be better prepared for this uh, because we are losing the, the, the battle over diverging or, or different narratives with which respective uh, uh, participants are communicating in the initial phase. It, it seemed for our citizens, obviously, that maybe societies that are not open, they are uh, centralized, they are better able to cope with that, which is true, by the way, uh, because it's much easier in a centralized governance to prescribe to your people uh, how they should behave. In our societies, it was so difficult to explain to our people when we were changing our legislation, allowing state authorities to track their mobility. So uh, I believe the second, second front of, of this battle, I believe, in terms of uh, propaganda and our effort to stop spreading in, uh, this, this information is extremely important because that's the only way how people can accept what the governments are asking from, from uh, our own citizens when it comes to the limits and restrictions we have to impose to protect their health. So once again, this. This is, uh, I think, also an important part of our struggle with, against pandemia. Uh, Mr. Interfering, I, I would like to take you up on that as well, please. Um, what, what do you think Germany should have done differently, uh, if you could go back? <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, firstly, let, let me say that the, the trio presidency uh, with uh, Portugal and Slovenia, but also the close cooperation with Croatia as an outgoing presidency can send a so strong signal of unity and cohesion. And uh, I also like to say that I agree that the um, agreement on the next MFF and the recovery instrument was not easy to achieve, but it is nevertheless historic. Regarding Germany, you know, in general, new situations needs new answers. So I think that we won't get any further by just going on like we have before. And um, this applies to health as well as to other challenges of our time. Um, regarding climate change, migration, opportunities for digitalization, the rule of law, social cohesion, and other fields. And of course, this is a discussion we also have in Germany um, within the society as well. And, uh, but these are big challenges that affect us all. So I am sure that the lessons um, we can learn from the COVID crisis are also applicable to, to all these other areas. And the challenge is far from over these days. The infection numbers are on the rise again. And um, however, um, this is a very dynamic situation, not only in Germany, but also in Europe. And this is why uh, we believe that the close cooperation is more important than ever. 
also to, to minimize the negative side effects on our economic, uh, economic cooperation, but also on the European way of life. And uh, in Germany, um, it's a vital discussion, but uh, what we see is uh, that we have to reach out to civil society as well and, uh, yeah, um, have this vital discussion uh, within the media, of course, uh, but also within uh, the parliament. And, uh, yeah, that is also, uh, one thing. I think this is very important also for, for the next month. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Mr. Petricek, if I could uh, turn to you, please. Um, you mentioned in, in your previous statement how easy it was, in a sense, to freeze freedom of movement. What would you do differently now, knowing what you know today? I believe that uh, we need to think how to improve uh, our crisis management in general. Uh, it is not the first uh, crisis Europe uh, is facing. We have uh, faced uh, uh, migration crisis, and uh, I believe that uh, we lack a bit of uh, imagination what can be the future crisis uh, we will need to face together. Maybe we should uh, really think how to prepare for unexpected uh, and how to especially stick together when uh, uh, this situation emerges in the future. Because uh, as, uh, as we discussed at the, at the beginning, it was a very human reaction. Uh, we did what we had to do. Uh, we came with the national solution because it is uh, the competence of member states. It, was, it is like in plain. They are telling you first, uh, uh, put the mask on your face and then uh, start uh, putting it on uh, your neighbor's uh, uh, faces. Uh, but uh, for the future, I think that uh, we really need to work more on the resilience of uh, uh, our society against a possible future crisis. We need to think uh, about the crisis management in general, and uh, we need to think where, uh, in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity, is the role of the European Union in all of that. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to um, ask uh, Mr. Radman what you think could have gone better in Croatia? I mean, where would you see, were there mistakes made that you would now like to see changed in terms of how it was handled? So, um, thank you, actually, and um, this is a big experience, once again, that, uh, first of all, uh, you know that uh, the main uh, economic uh, brain is in, uh, the uh, tourism in Croatia. Unfortunately, for 20%, 20 percent, and they would like also to enhance the, uh, the other sectors of, of the economy. However, but uh, uh, what is important that uh, for all of us that so we are uh, we are forced uh, to adapt uh, uh, the, this pa pandemic, the COVID-19, uh, forced us uh, to adapt uh, to the new reality, and of course, method of of, co of cooperation and of course settings uh, setting a standard uh, uh, for to uh, to them uh, who come uh, after us of course but for croatia it's um, really an uh, uh, the uh, the awareness of the necessity to uh, to work together because the uh, the situation with the, with the pandemic, the, the closure of the borders of the member states just uh, caused the problems uh, in the mobility and trade. And so Croatia could not rely on itself. That means uh, the situation also to some extent uh, saw the rise of the importance of the national state because European uh, Union is composition of the uh, uh, member states, uh, sovereign member states. And that's important, but however, European Union doesn't have alternative for Croatia. That's, that means we need each other. For example, so I mentioned that Croatia uh, is a touristic uh, country, and of course our uh, friends, uh, neighboring countries, so we are just in a, so traditionally relying on them, and uh, we were very happy also to, to welcome uh, the tourists uh, from our uh, uh, partners in the, uh, from the European Union, but um, it's an also, to, for example, good lesson how we could also there improve the, this moment, uh, how 
to could avoid also the, the blockage on the borders. You know, we, we saw there are not so nice pictures when the people, families, and uh, waited uh, about 12 or 13 uh, hours and, uh, on the borders to check it and so on. I think so, we, we, there's, there's uh, rooms and scope for, for actions. More and uh, the future, the future we, uh, we have, we know what, what does it mean, uh, a pandemic, we should uh, to learn and that and of course to, to live with them. It's very important and how we also should be uh, independent, for example, for others. It, is it uh, China or is it other, just to, to make cohesion policy even better European and to, to be on, uh, uh, to, to rely on ourselves. Thank you very much. Mr. Rao, can I ask, uh, what do you think should have gone better for Poland in the last few months in terms of regional oh. cooperation? Uh, from the Polish perspective, I believe we <coughs> uh, see that uh, uh, it would be absolutely necessary to enhance the U.S. strategic uh, resilience and self-dependence on our economies in strategic sectors. Uh, for example, what we have to rethink very seriously is how to enhance reindustrialization and relocation of manufacturing back to the, to the EU. How to ensure access to critical raw materials and how to invest in strategic infrastructure, including uh, digital. The other thing, as far as uh, economy is concerned, I think it's worth uh, rethinking how to strengthen value chains, to make them shorter, safer, and more sustainable. Uh, the other thing that we could uh, realize after the experience with the coronavirus virus is that uh, this uh, event uh, accelerated pre-existing negative global trends. It's enough to mention here the growing antagonism between the biggest actors in international politics. Of course, I mean the competition uh, between the US and, and China. And the consequence of that is the widening uh, digital uh, divide across the world. So these are the things that uh, require rethinking at every level, at the regional level, national level, and of course, of course, uh, at the uh, European Union uh, uh, level. And the last thing that I would like to, uh, to, to stress here, when we think about in also <clears throat> as a result of the pandemic, when we think about the EU-US uh, 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 relations, I suppose that it's the pandemic proved that <clears throat> uh, if the European Union uh, wants to play <clears throat> a, a global, uh, successful a global, global role, it shouldn't uh, consider itself as a, a, a standalone actor because uh, I, we, we in Poland really believe that <clears throat> the relations with the US it's an, an asset uh, rather than hindrance in the, mm, uh, in the position of the, of the European uh, Union as a, uh, in, the global, in the global world. And the last thing I would like to say in terms of this competition between China and the United States, I mean, we have so much in common with the, the United States that it would be a mistake, given the experience of pandemic, to think that uh, our, we, we, we have an equal distance to China and to the, to the United States. I suppose that what we learn from the pandemic, it's, it's exactly that this is not true. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, um, Mr. Siarto, I would like to say, from Hungary's perspective, what went wrong and what would you do differently? 
Well, I'd like to highlight here two issues shortly, if you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, first, that um, um, the way we were treated by the international liberal mainstream when it comes to media and politics as well under these very challenging circumstances was uh, very unfair. So I just couldn't understand how it was possible that um, some politicians of other countries had so much time to criticize and attack uh, Hungary, the Hungarian government, the Hungarian legislation, putting into consideration that all governments had their national duties to, uh, uh, to protect their people, protect the health of them, protect uh, the economies uh, by medical equipments, and so on and so forth. There were European politicians who, I think, uh, uh, were making statements about Hungary um, on a 24-7 basis. And uh, our legislation was criticized in a very bad way, saying that we would be building dictatorship, that uh, we would never give back to rights to parliament, that uh, we use this uh, situation to strengthen our position. And then uh, when within 85 days, as far as I remember, we uh, concluded, we seized the state of emergency, gave back all the rights to parliament, nobody apologized. Nobody said that, okay, sorry, we were right. This government was just protecting its people and not, not uh, uh, creating dictatorship. So, so I think that un at least under such situations, when thousands of European people die on a daily basis, when tens of thousands get infected, when jobs of tens of thousands um, are at risk on a daily basis, at least under such circumstances, such accusations of other fellow member states uh, you know, should be avoided. The second issue I would like to uh, uh, mention shortly is economy. So we have to understand that this pandemic is not only a risk regarding healthcare, this is a risk regarding employment as well. And uh, parallelly to putting the life and the health situation of European people at risk, this pandemic put the jobs of the European people at risk as well. So right after following the protective measures on the field of uh, healthcare, we have to introduce very serious and very robust measures in order to save the jobs of the people. And how you can save jobs is, you know, it's not a miracle, you have to support the companies. Because if you support the companies, they will be able to save or create uh, additional jobs. That's why what we have done from the very beginning was that we uh, started to implement a very robust economic package to finance those companies which are ready to invest under such challenging circumstances in order to uh, maintain the headcount or even increase because what we see on the long term as a challenge is what kind of impact this pandemic and the post-pandemic or second wave or whatever uh, will put on the economies. And in order, in order to, uh, to save um, the, um, let's say, the predictability of the life of the people, we rather believe in these kind of economic uh, investment incentive packages than to social uh, aids, let's put it this way. Thank you very much. So we have there an example of some of the tensions that have emerged during this pandemic. We all expect uh, another very difficult winter ahead. Are we going to see more such tensions as uh, referred to by Mr. Seattle emerging, or are we going to see Europe pulling together even more. What do you think absolutely needs to happen, Mr. Borrell, in the next few months in order to ensure um, a smoother, better future for Europe? Are, are we going to emerge stronger from this? Sorry, in order to ensure what? I haven't understood. Uh, to ensure that we get better, that tensions are brought down rather than inflamed. Um, how do you see the next few months progressing? Well, in the next month, the most important challenge will be an economic one. On that, I agree with Peter. And for sure, the economic problem will have social consequences and maybe political consequences. But the first, the economic one. In some member states, it's going to be a mass unemployment. We have put the economy on a kind of induced coma. Stop it. And when you stop the economy, many people lose their works, many firms get in bankruptcy, and this is a, a negative spiral. 
So we have to counterbalance these dynamics with, as Peter said, a lot of investment. But keep in mind that you invest to produce more. But if there is not demand, it's useless to produce more. So we have to maintain revenues of people. We have to maintain the capital of the firms. We have to provide a lot of monetary cheap intervention, cheap money. The European Central Bank is doing that very quickly, by the way. The implementation of the economic package will be decisive, and it's not going to be so easy, because to spend 750,000 million euros, uh, three quarters of a trillion, with conditionalities, because nobody is going to give the money without any kind of condition. This money is for developing a green and a digital economy and to face the challenge of the crisis. Will put at proof the administrative capacities of the member states. Let apart the problem of political uh, ratification. Implementation will not be so so easy, but our economy, the overall European economy, will be on the strong shock after the summer, when people come back from holidays and then they found that many firms have disappeared and many people will not have a, a sustain, a revenue. And that is going to be a big proof for the European solidarity. The, the recovery package was the first step, but it has to be implemented. And the central bank has to continue buying uh, as much as uh, European assets as needed in order to provide liquidity to the firms. And we have to be f ready to face a very unpleasant economic situation. That's the reality, and I think that we have to face it the way it is. Some member states are less affected than others, but you know, we are very much integrated. If one member state goes bad, the others will also go bad, and the answer has to be a collective one. Dr. Logo, if I could ask you how you feel that regional initiatives like the Three Seas initiatives can help deal with some of these challenges that we'll be facing in the next few months. Yeah, they can if we properly use it. But, but just to go a bit backwards, I, I fully agree what Mr. Ciarto and Mr. Borrell said. The economy is the key for the incoming months. And this should, every government should be aware of that. Uh, what, for example, Hungary did, they supported the company that, that invested in these hard times, is now doing European Union. We have this recovery fund to invest in the project that will bear fruits in future. For this to happen, we should have stable government and foresighted oriented government with no this, you know, political propaganda, uh, I mean, politicizing every decision and going one against another. Just to show you a brief example, in the case of Slovenia. In Slovenia, we normally were successful in using per year around 300 to 400 millions of euros. With this recovery package, we have a span of 1.2 billion per year. So we have to be very quick, very good, and we have invest into project that will be, you know, that in coming years of uh, value asset for development of Slovenia. So in that sense, we need a stability, and I definitely it's now the period when we have a deal we should not politicize in, in the future. And this is the, on all of our governments to act like this. And as a presiding country, in our program, we are putting uh, as well the reference on easing the procedure for, for cohesion funds for an other funds in order to speed up the procedure, not to be too bureaucratized as sometimes we think the procedures are. Mr. Korczak, if I could ask you, how do we avoid politicizing the pandemic? Well, I think it's impossible <laughs> to make the long story short. Uh, because w what does it prevent politicization? Uh, it's, a, it's a public affair in a way, and therefore it's normal that, that you have competing political views, political clashes over it. 
take, for example, I wanted to come back to what we really mean by coordination in this, in this very area. It has become a buzzword. Of course, coordination is never good enough. It can always be better. But this time, you have to realize that traditional coordination as we know it, meaning getting in touch with each other and coordinate some joint effort, does not work. At this moment, decisions about closing borders is not a result of a political decision. Uh, Hungary has closed its border over weekend, but I never interpret that as a political decision. It's a, in their interpretation, a responsible reaction to what's going on when it comes to uh, pandemia. In, in our case, in case of all our countries, those who are deciding right now about closing borders, it's epidemiologists. Uh, I was heavily criticized for my inability in Slovakia to convince United Kingdom uh, not to put Slovakia on a red list. I found it a bit really strange that Slovakia appeared on a red list from the, from the UK perspective, while UK was a safe country for us. But I had, I, it was so difficult for me uh, to explain to Slovak public, I am not up to, because it's their sovereign decision. You cannot apply reciprocity, for example. So if somebody has open borders vis-a-vis -vis Slovakia, it does not mean that we have to reciprocate. It will be politicized. Number two, I totally agree with my, all my colleagues stressing uh, basically the need to do our utmost uh, for the economic recovery. No doubt about that. But still, we are right now in a second wave of pandemia. Good news is that we know from the first wave you know, how to proceed. In, regionally, we don't need to uh, discover uh, the, the the way of, of, of uh, communication amongst us that will that will inevitably uh, continue. Two, we have to see it is not going to be very costly economically within our national states or on European level, but globally as well, because we need to mobilise uh, assistance and huge uh, funds to help. Uh, least or less developed regions around the world. There are many of them who have been unfortunately plagued by regional conflicts. In addition, they are going to be plagued by pandemia. But globally, we can never stop it unless we really tackle it, uh, it globally. Developing the vaccine and making sure that all have access to it. So there are huge, huge uh, challenges ahead, uh, ahead of us. It will be a political issue. And last point, in Europe it is exceptional and I praise us for really uh, being able to mobilize the huge money. But now, you know, we have to do our homework, prepare our national recovery plans. European Union must not become a scapegoat uh, eventually uh, when we are not able to tackle our economies uh, back home using European funds. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Mutufering, if I could ask you, how should the European Union be prevented from becoming a scapegoat, uh, and how do you see um, cooperation being enhanced over the next few months? I'm convinced that everything uh, that uh, can be agreed internationally uh, beyond national borders uh, can be helpful. and. Um, of course, when cohesion is the major importance, um, this also needs economic progress and participation. A development um, people in Europe need to see and feel. And um, I think we shouldn't forget about many positive examples of people's engagement as well. Most of all, civil society. Um, this includes the achievements on the communal level as well. So, for example, hospitals taking care of patients from abroad, like in my home region in Bochum, in the rural district in the western part of Germany. So, after the Second World War, um, it was the civil society um, helping uh, to make friendship 
um, between different countries again, yeah. between our countries again. And so I think that um, on the first hand, yes, economy, of course, has a major role in making cohesion within the international, the international agreements, but also not forget about the civil society who is taking part at the moment and is engaged and also stressed by political decisions. Uh, we heard about uh, um, the agreements or the decisions about closing borders again. One thing we couldn't imagine uh, uh, before uh, we get into this pandemic situation. So um, I think uh, the political um, leaders um, have to go on with the, um, the spirit of a spirit of building and not to split. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Petrocek, if I could ask you, do you think the EU is going to emerge weaker or stronger from this over the next few months? Uh, I'm always optimistic and I believe that the EU will be stronger, that we will uh, take the lessons uh, uh, we learn seriously and uh, we will do our homework at uh, the level of member states but at uh, the EU level as well. And uh, I think that uh, for us it will be very important to use this as an opportunity uh, to strengthen our economy. We have uh, enormous package, economic package. Uh, uh, available. Uh, we need to invest in infrastructure, in the modernization of our industry. Uh, we need to make our industry greener. We need to invest in new technologies. Uh, that is uh, uh, the key for the competitiveness uh, for the future. Uh, it is the key to uh, keep good jobs in Europe. I believe that our aim is not to be touristic uh, destination for the rest of the world. Uh, we need to be uh, the cutting-edge uh, uh, technological and industrial uh, centre of the world. And uh, this is the opportunity uh, we need uh, to fully use. We need also to uh, speed up the convergence in Europe in terms of uh, our economies, in terms of our uh, social situations across the Europe. But I believe that uh, this situation also provides an opportunity to work on, uh, uh, let's say, strategic convergence, so uh, the way we understand our interests in the world, uh, the way how we can promote our interests uh, together, and I believe that the uh, EU needs to change. It is not possible to return back to what was before, uh, but uh, I believe that together we can be stronger, maybe without, without giving, up, giving up on uh, being a little bit of Kant, we need also to find a little bit of hopes in us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Gordon goddard Radman. for you, how do you see the most important steps now if the EU is to be strengthened, if regional cooperation is to be strengthened? What would you like to see happen? I see on the, on the example of the Three Seas Initiative as a good example for cooperation among the uh, Central European countries. Uh, so we recognize uh, the that uh, in their uh, countries and in the European Union, there are disparities or differences between their, uh, among their central uh, 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 eastern countries. And I think so by strengthening the, the main pillars like their uh, traffic infrastructure or transport, uh, digitalization and, and energy, we could just uh, this, uh, this possibility how to enhance the cooperation and to reduce uh, the dis disparity among the uh, member states of the European Union and of course to, to help the uh, growth of the, of, the, of the economy among the European Union. Just what is interest and uh, so uh, of the European, uh, so the cohesion and the convergency, so they are uh, now a new policies and uh, we had uh, the cohesion uh, cohesion and uh, uh, and uh, the agriculture but they are so innovation uh, uh, hybrid rates uh, uh, searching innovation and so on 
And it's necessary just uh, to get uh, to this project uh, to uh, for the Eastern Central European countries to get along with the, with the Western, Western country, countries and to, to build a real, a really a uh, home again as a uh, as, uh, unity, as a uh, as, uh, 27 countries. If we like to be uh, the, the same, we just uh, have to, to invest in that. And that is, I think, the, the initiative, the uh, 3C initiative, I see that uh, scope for action. Of course, uh, what is uh, uh, very, very important, so that, like my colleagues uh, mentioned, that uh, the recovery plan, it's really necessary to, to put it in force as soon as possible. And with this multi-annual framework, we should just uh, finish with the whole legislature uh, to, through the European Parliament and just uh, to, to, to see the, the, the uh, result, the outcome of this. And uh, we need it because uh, our, uh, through the pandemic uh, to COVID-19, so um, our, our, uh, our economy, uh, not only in the Central or the Eastern European countries, it's really injured and uh, we need really a push uh, uh, into our economy and of course, uh, social stability. Uh, Mr. Rao, if I could ask you, and then Mr. Siarto, um, what do you think is going to emerge stronger after the next few months, the EU or the nation state? The EU, EU or what? The nation state. Well, <clears throat> I would, uh, I'm not inclined to, to put the nation state vis-a-vis uh, to the EU because these are complementary values and they, uh, uh, one side needs, uh, needs the other. But <clears throat> uh, I suppose that uh, if we think properly uh, about the future and we have to think uh, certainly above all in economic terms, so there is a good chance that both the national states and the European Union are uh, going to be, to be much stronger but, uh, after this experience. But what is crucial here is that uh, the uh, pandemic has been an extraordinary experience, something that we have never uh, uh, faced before. And in order to <clears throat> uh, overcome all these uh, difficulties that it's caused, we need an extraordinary measure. We need extraordinary measures. F from this perspective, look at the, at the European Recovery Fund. Nobody would have thought about it, say, a year ago. It would be absolutely impossible to, to in, in the European Union to think this to think this way. And now there is a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, about <coughs> about this uh, uh, this instrument, because why is that? Because uh, to to come up with something as uh, like that uh, with a recovery fund, it required courage, wisdom, and above all, vision. It's something that <coughs> uh, didn't happen to such an extent uh, 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 before, <coughs> and uh, as you. Mm. Alluded to the to the nation state, I prefer to think in in uh, regional terms about our economic future. And uh, my, I'm absolutely <coughs> convinced that, for example, uh, Free Seas Initiative uh, requires to to implement it requires a similar uh, courage, wisdom, and above all, imagination, because what we need right now is uh, a, a strong belief in our common goals, uh, not national goals, but regional goals and European goals. And <clears throat> if you have a, 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 an extraordinary vision that make it, it possible for you to think that you can uh, overcome all these <clears throat> Uh, weaknesses and gaps uh, that it's uh, that they had been uh, uh, our our uh, experience in this part of Europe. If you care this uh, uh, infrastructure, especially 
transport infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Uh, so, and you realize how much uh, 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 behind the Western Europe we, we found ourselves. And now that there is such an opportunity to, to overcome it and to, to make our economies in this part of Europe more competitive and to uh, improve our standard of, of living and, 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 and so on, and to uh, create more instruments for uh, uh, stability and cohesion in the uh, European Union as a whole. I suppose that this is the best thing that could have, could have come out of this, of this experience of this pandemic, because Thank it's you. natural, yes. just one sentence, if you allow me, it, it uh, creates enthusiasm on the part of all of us in the western part of Europe and in the central and eastern part of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Siarto, if I could ask you, um, the EU or the nation state to emerge stronger? <clears throat> Two uh, short uh, points, if you don't mind, as an answer to that. First, I also do not really uh, prefer this artificial conflict uh, generated between uh, the concept of strong member states and the concept of strong uh, European Union, because I do believe that the European Union can only be strong if it is based on strong member states. I mean, how could we imagine European Union to be strong if the member states themselves are weakened. It's like 11 uh, football players with poor skills will definitely not form a good team. Now, if you have 11 stars, you don't have the guarantee that it's going to be a Champions League winner, but you definitely have a better chance. So I think that uh, it should be the interest of the European institutions as well to strengthen the member states themselves. I think this is another lecture or another um, consequence we can understand from the uh, current crisis, because those member states which were strong, which would have good networks, stable finances, stable political background, they could face uh, the recent challenges, I think, a little bit uh, better than, uh, than others. But the second point I'd like to raise is what European Union should do now, and I would like to come back to economy again. I think currently we should ease all those restrict, restrictive uh, regulations which we have in place regarding state aid when it comes to financing investments. Because currently, the European Union has a pretty strict set of regulations. I mean, under peaceful circumstances, it's, let's say, understandable, uh, although it creates some difficulties, but understandable, that the states are uh, not that much allowed to finance investments of private companies in their countries. But now I think months and years are coming when European Union should ease this restrictive approach at least a little bit, allowing states to finance investments by private companies as well, because without that, Without that, we will not be able to save the jobs of the people, because these robust uh, European policies are fine, nice. Uh, we definitely have to finance um, uh, countries. But if you are not able to finance those companies, which will create jobs for our people, then I think uh, we will not be, as European Union, among the winners of this new global race among the new global economic circumstances. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the plan had been to also put a couple of questions from the public who've been sending answers in, but unfortunately the iPad with those questions on has died because of lack of battery, and I think we all may be flagging a bit after such an interesting and intense morning of discussions. So um, I will say thank you very, very much to my distinguished panel, uh, to uh, Ms. Müntefering in Berlin as well for joining us today. Thank you very much. This is the end of the session in the Bled Festival Hall, but of course it continues in the hotel this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed.